My young man, bless you. Come on, give him a round of applause. <laughs> uh, you may be seated. This is so good. This is so good. You know, it's such a joy. Um, you know, this, uh, just before I was leaving for church, uh, both my sons took turns to kind of wish me and bless me and all that. I'm sure all you children have done that. And, you know, it overwhelms you when your children begin to bless you, isn't it? You know, and I'm like, wow. You know, it's like, yeah, they, they got me this time, you know. My heart totally melted down just to hear them say how much they love me. And I was thinking while worshiping, you know, how much the Father would be looking upon us when we turn on and tell him how much we love him. You know, just think of that for a moment. How much the Father, you know, I, I'm thinking about Luke 15. I know I, I'm, I'm supposed to preach a message, but if you allow me to just flow for a bit. The father stands for the prodigal son to come back. What a love. And then he brings him home, and then the older son is out of the house, doesn't want to come into the party. Then he goes out again to bring the older son into the house. What a father. The lesson that you and I can learn out of this is that walk in grace and forgiveness. The more you walk with grace and forgiveness, you can conquer the world and your children can conquer the world. That's the only principle that I've learned. There's a little book by, written by our founding pastor, John Arnott, Grace and Forgiveness. Get hold of that book. It's like under $3, I think it is. But a book that changed my life. And I'm telling you, friends, it's a beautiful little thing that I carry in my heart. Wow, that's good. Well, they got me this morning. I was hoping the ladies would give us some ribs and chicken and... Well, like Marina got us only prayers, which is good, but, you know... <laughs> Spiritual ribs, okay, you know. We were, like, thinking there was going to be platters coming out. And we all have to have a competition of eating some good ribs and some hot dogs and something like that. Mike and I were looking forward to that, by the way. No, it didn't happen. Right, Mike? Or spicy food. I know Mike likes spicy food. You know, it's good. Turn your Bible with me to Galatians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. I want to prepare your heart to give unto the Lord. As you know, we believe in partnership. That's what I want to talk to you about today. It's very biblical to co-labor with people who are for the kingdom. By the way, we have kids' ministry for little kids. We also have kids' ministry for little older kids, but they only happen uh, twice a month. So kids, you have the privilege to sit with us today. Um, so today we don't have kids' ministry for older kids. I want to talk to you about partnership, the importance of partnership according to Galatians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. This is Paul writing to the churches of Galatia. Mind you, it is not a church, plural, churches of Galatia. And recognizing the grace bestowed on me, James and Cephas, which is Peter, and John, who are reputed to be pillars of the Jerusalem, gave to me Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. That one right hand of fellowship is called partnership. So that we could go to the Gentiles, they asked only one thing. We remember the poor, the very thing I was also eager to do. Paul, who is, in my best guess, is the 12th apostle after Judas Iscariot left. They appointed Matthias, but we never hear of Matthias in the Bible, but I think it's Paul in my best guess. We also see Paul sought the Lord, which we're going to go through it today. And then we, we recognize Paul has this vision given by the Lord himself, but he was unstoppable. That's what I love about Paul. He was unstoppable. So when I come across people in my life who are unstoppable, we met two ladies from India, Manisha and Natasha. They put their life on hold. They didn't want to get married. They, they had high 
paste jobs. One was in the finance, one was in the IT, one was in UK, one was in Canada, both met somewhere. They moved back to India. They laid their life down. They've starting ministries for the Lord over there called the Spread the Word Church, recently partnered with Catch the Fire. And I said, man, this, I love this people's heart. We said, we're going to support your widow's program. And we're beginning that job probably by the end of this month. Pastor Jimmy Kim doing Blue Tent Church, going after the poor, going after the homeless. Hey, Jimmy, we're going to support you with this. What is this? This is where God's heart moves. This is where God's heart sees. Like, are they going after my kingdom? Are they pursuing people who are lost in the world? So if you read the scripture very carefully, the three pillars that they talk about is James, which is a half-brother of Jesus, which is Peter and John. Who were they? They were carpenters. They were fishermen. Who was Paul? A very highly educated man, a Pharisee of the Pharisee of a high order. Humbled himself before these leaders and he says, I will humble myself to you, but I want you to know I am called for the Gentiles. He went totally outside of his, of his family, of his tribe, of his community, and said, I'm called for the Gentiles. They blessed him to go, and they said, but do not forget the poor. And they, Paul bought, brought in probably more offerings back to Jerusalem than any other person. What I'm trying to say here, my friends, I said, when we give unto the Lord through our church, we are not only trying to, we like to get nice cameras, you know. Bernie was, and I was talking to Bernie the other day. Hey, Bernie, what would it cost me to place three cameras and get it knees and that? Ah, uh, about $5,000. Okay, wow, that's a fat check right there, $5,000. Okay, but that's not my priority right now. Let's, what, what, the widows need help right now. The poor need help right now. Well, that's the priority. Let's go after that. So I just want to encourage you, as you give and as you sow, I want you to know the Lord hears your prayers. I just want you to know that. Cornelius' prayers were heard, Acts chapter 10. His arms and his giving came before the Lord, and the Lord heard his prayer. So whenever you think of the poor, whenever you think of the widows, whenever you think of them, remember this in your heart. That God hears your prayers. So thank you for giving. Thank you for sowing. Let's can take a moment and pray. Would that be all right? Father, we just thank you. We thank you that you enable us to have a paycheck week after week. Thank you, Father, that you enable us to have the best things in this country. Thank you, Father, we have the very best things, the food we can choose in this country. Father, we thank you the very best beds we can choose in this country, the very best house, the very best cars we can choose in this country. And you are not trying to ask us to be stingy. We want to have the very best in our life. But also, Father, we want to give into the kingdom because we want to be just like you, a generous, good, good Father. So, Father, we ask you, would you bless our congregation today? Could you bless our family today as they give and as they sow that their bonds would be full, that their vats would be full, that they would know that our Heavenly Father provides and they will never lack in their life. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Wow. Anybody got a testimony you want to share? Jeff, would you like to come and share? I remember you sent me that thing, and I loved it. We had a great time at his son's wedding. And, you know, it is an absolute fun time we had. I've never seen Jeff and Juliana enjoy. I'll stay out of that word. <laughs> Pastor, we, this was the first time we saw you so joyful, too. Yeah. And uh, our picture with you yes. came out amazing. You look I'm absolutely handsome. Thank you. Thank yes. I, I will uh, share that picture with you later. Okay, okay. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to our Father in Heaven yes. who has given us uh, children. That's why we are dad and mom. 
and for the opportunity that every parent has, and that is to see their children um, get married. So we are blessed that we were able to participate in our son's wedding in person um, uh, just a few days ago. So we praise God for that. But uh, in this testimony is another testimony uh, of his goodness and faithfulness. Uh, they were married in Cambridge um, at uh, a golf club. Uh, spring. Whistle yeah, whistle, yeah, whistle bear. Whistle bear. Yeah. Uh, but there was 60% chance of precipitation of rain that day. Yeah. So this was like a week ago we saw that forecast. So I prayed in agreement with Juliana. And my prayer that I was standing on was that, Lord, you held the sun for Joshua. Mm. Hold the rain for our Joshua. In the name of Jesus, I pray and ask. And I did not bother to carry umbrella. I did not, I did not look at the forecast after that. And I said, Lord, if it rains, it rains. But if it doesn't rain, it's because you are good. You have heard my prayers. So my faith was that it will not rain. That is what my faith was. And I had peace. And God was and is faithful. It did not rain. Not Hallelujah. So all glory to him because he answers prayers. Yeah. All glory to him that he is faithful. The song today that, you know, I thank him for his goodness. And I just bless you with his goodness in your lives as well. Mm. I bless you with faithfulness in his faithfulness in your lives as well. And may you also see your children's weddings. And may God take you through that. Amen. Oh, come on. Now, hold on right here. How many would like a prayer right now? Come on, just stand right now. We allow the Holy Spirit to interrupt the meeting, because I just feel the anointing right on that. You know, when, he, when Jeff said, if you could ask Joshua, if Joshua from the Bible could tell, I want the son to stand still, his son's name is Josh, their, their son's name is Joshua. We were there at the wedding. It was cloudy, but not a drop of water on the ground. Not a drop of water on the ground. What a beautiful wedding it was, you know. God can do that for you. So Jeff and Juliana, would you mind both praying and agree with them right now? Because Matthew 2, 18, 19 says, when two agree, the power of agreement only needs two people. Come on, stand right now and agree. So Father, I pray in agreement with Juliana. And I pray, Lord, for all the needs of the people. If you have a need, please raise your hand. Just God knows this is between you and God. If you have a need for your children. So, Father, in agreement with Juliana, in the name of Jesus, we bless all the people, the family members here, the church members here. We bless their family. We bless their children. And we pray, Lord, that you are the God of miracles. You are the God of the miracles that happened in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And today, Lord, you are the God of miracles that are happening in this church. And Lord, I speak your miracle, your faithfulness and goodness in their lives as well, in the lives of every person present here today. Lord, what you did for us, I pray that you will also do for each one of them. Hallelujah. To you be all the praise and glory. And thank you, Father, that we serve a good, good God. A happy Father's Day to you, Father. To you be all the glory. Amen. Yes, Heavenly Father, stand in agreement with Jeff. And Heavenly Father, just open the windows of heaven, O oh yes. Father. Flow your blessings, Lord God, from heaven. Touch each one of us today, O oh Father, and fulfill all the desires of their hearts, O oh Lord God. Heavenly Father, there's nothing, Lord, that you cannot do. But we, with you, Lord, all things are possible. So we stand on your word, Lord, and we keep believing, Lord God for all the good things which you have in store for each one of us. So bless all of us today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask. Amen. Amen. Ah, come on. Come on. Come on. Give them a round of applause. For, and let's believe for God to do in your life. You know, you may be seated. Um, you know, it's so important for us to be mindful of what the Holy Spirit is doing at that very moment. And it's, it's got very important, friends. We can go on with the programs and all that stuff. But if you're not mindful of what the anointing is moving at that time, we just miss it. Yeah. 
you know. So I just felt there was an anointing on it right there and there, you know. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. If you're already in Galatians, turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. And we're going to read from verse 11. Last Sunday, I talked to you about how Jesus from Mark chapter 2, you know, moved away from the Pharisee of Pharisees, and he picked up the tax collector, Matthew, to be one of his disciples. That's what I kind of left off with last Sunday. You know, the Pharisees, the tax collectors, and they were all in the same category. But even though the Pharisees knew the Bible, knew the scriptures and everything, Jesus still picked Matthew, a tax collector, to be one of his disciples. So we're going to do a little bit of a reverse today. We're going to look at Paul, who is a Pharisee of a Pharisee, a highly educated guy, and Jesus picks him up to be one of his disciples. So we're studying this in this next few Sundays about how to be a follower of Jesus, how to be a good follower of Jesus, because it is important. You know, the word Christian is a beautiful label but it's been misrepresented in many different ways. We want to be, start calling ourselves as I'm a follower of Jesus. The moment you say I'm a follower of Jesus, our life, lifestyle has to be begin to modeled according, according to Jesus. And that's what Paul did. So look at Galatians chapter 1 from verse 11. For I want you to know, believers, that the gospel which was preached by me is not a man's gospel. For indeed I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a direct revelation of Jesus Christ. You have heard of my career and former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to hunt down and persecute the church of God extensively, and you have heard how I surpassed many of my contempor contemporaries among my countrymen in my advanced study of the law of Judaism as I was extremely loyal to the tradition of my ancestors. But when God, I love that line. Come on, let everybody say that. But when God, won't you love that when God interrupts your life and says, but when God who had chosen me and set me apart before I was born, called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me. Get hold of that. But when God, who had chosen me and set me apart before I was born, called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone nor did I even go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia, stayed a while, and afterwards returned to Damascus. Then three years later, I did go up to Jerusalem to acquaint myself with Peter, and I stayed there for 15 days. But I did not see any other apostle except James, a half-brother. And he goes on explaining that what he does. I want to help you see this evening Paul's former life. He was a Pharisee of Pharisee. He had the zeal for God. He had a zeal for God, but his actions were not of God. He had, a, he had, he had pursued for God. He, he studied the word. He, he taught the best things, but his life was in representing God. And Jesus encounters him. Don't you love that? When Jesus encounters you, how many would like an encounter with the Lord? That's what I want to talk to you about today. I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, one encounter with the Lord is what you and I need. We don't need a lot of dreams and visions if I get one encounter with the Lord. We don't, dreams and visions helps us. You know, I remember when we sent our old, oldest son, Sheldon, for the first uh, children's retreat, you know, for a week. Youth retreat, you know, uh, through Catch the Fire. And this was the very first time that our son is going to be away from us for a week. And everything in us, like, 
we were like sad in our hearts and like, oh my gosh, she's gone for a week. And so we were also missing him. So we all went to his bedroom and we all slept in his bedroom. That's how much we missed him, you know. And even worse, we all slept on his bed, a single bed, you know. <laughs> Just think how good we were, right? So I'm at the edge of this bed and I'm fast asleep. And somewhere in the middle of the night, I see a bright light at the door. And I see this bright light at the door and I see the Lord. I saw the Lord and I saw his eyes beaming at me. And I'm trying to get up and I'm trying to, Lord, is it you? Lord, is it you? I couldn't speak. I couldn't say nothing. All I knew that it was the Lord. And I got up in the morning and I told Marina, I saw the Lord. And he didn't say a word, nothing. And that night the Lord gave me a peace that nothing will happen to your boys. And that encounter changed my life. That encounter gave me peace in my heart that the Lord is real. And I want to let you know, you hunger for an encounter, you will hunger for more encounters. I've been crying out to the Lord, God, I need another encounter. What does an encounter do? It wrecked Paul's life. The guy was a highly educated man. You know Mark chapter 2? He was sitting among the poorest of the poor, healing the man who was, uh, who was uh, lame. And these Pharisees were arguing in their hearts. How can this man forgive this man's sin? Jesus being fully God, hidden in a man's body, perceiving what's going on in their heart. He says, why do you... Debate in your heart. Paul was such a highly educated man. And such a brave man. Such a bold man. And the Lord had to meet him face to face. And he encountered him. When he encountered him. Every education that was in him. Got completely wiped out. And his life became just to reveal Jesus. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Do you love his books? Do you know why? Because of an encounter. It wasn't his education. It wasn't his theology of the theology. It wasn't that he sat around with all these bright and smart people. It wasn't like that. It was an encounter with the Lord caused him to write what he wrote. Now let's turn to one of his books and let's turn to Romans chapter 12. And this amazes me, until, unless you don't know what happened to Paul, we, we'll find hard to understand what Paul is saying through some of his books, some of his chapters. Let's look at, from verse 1, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Many people say it's one of the hardest books to understand. Many theologians say it's one of the difficult books to read. Why? It's because that encounter with the Lord, that he became so consumed of the Lord himself. You know, I had this revelation just while I was studying this. Let me, I'll come to that. I'm running ahead of myself here. I'll come to that in a minute. Look at verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational act of worship. Paul, a highly educated man, now is completely ripped apart, and he's saying, make your life a living sacrifice for God which is an act of worship. So our understanding of worship has always been, okay, we got to come together Sunday morning, worship the Lord. He's saying, live a lifestyle of worship. Lay down your life every moment of your way. 
A man of Pharisee of Pharisees, a high man of a high degree and a high honor, had learning to humble his life and saying, lay down your life every second of your way. And read verse 2. Now that's what I'm trying to explain here. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, so that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Let me kind of dive into this for a few minutes. The word conformed is everything is put into the box. The word transformed is metamorphosis, which everything begins to open up. Everything begins to evolve. Everything begins to, we all know this. Now, here is something the Lord began to teach me. Jesus, according to Philippians chapter 2, Jesus, fully God, conformed himself into the man of God as a son of man. Is Jesus fully God when he walked on this earth? But he conformed himself into the man as a man. And he did not reveal his full deity as a man, uh, as, a, as God, but he operated by only what he heard the Father say. He operated by only saw what the Father did. Where am I going with this? Jesus, who was conformed into a man's body, so that you and I could be transformed into his likeness. You know, it shakes me when I think of that. Can you think of that? He conformed himself into a man's body so that you and I could be transformed into his likeness. He's been sent into this world so that you, can, I, you and I can walk in his likeness in today's world. That way you and I can hear the Father what he says and we can do what the Father says. We can see what the Father sees and we can say what the Father says. You have been given the kingdom, authority and power. The excusia and the dunamis has been given to us. So you can operate in that anointing. You know, I was at Jimmy's church last Tuesday. Man, it was pouring. Bless his heart, he was still worshipping away. It was raining. Bless his heart, he was still preaching. We were under a shed. And they were, people were all there. I was in a small group. And we started asking each other, what can we pray for you? This one particular lady, we, 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 what, would, what would you like to pray for you? She was a homeless woman. She said, I don't need any prayers, but I would like you to pray with me for people who are mentally disabled. And everything in me like, what? I'm like, what is she asking? She doesn't want prayer. She wants you to pray for thing. And because I, as a Christian, at eight years knew the Lord, but I slipped away, fell into this and that. I've turned to the Lord. But now my journey is to bring the mentally disabled people back to the Lord. Think of that, friends. Think of that. The Lord in you to reveal his son in you is what God is after you. God is after you, not for you to represent a Christian life. He's after you to re reveal his son in you, through you, for the people around you. At least say amen. amen. I know it's a bit of a hard message to preach. Wow. I'm almost done. I want to give you some practical steps. How can we prepare our heart for transformation? Actually, turn with me to the book of Corinthians. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 3, 17 to 18. I really want to 
bring this message to you, not because I want to finish a good message, but I really want to drive this in such a way that you get it in your heart that how much the Lord, you know the Lord is an intercessor? The Lord intercedes for you. If you read um, Hebrews chapter 12, the Lord is an intercessor. He's interceding for you and I. And this is what he's interceding for right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. From verse 16. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Pause for a second. Whenever the person repents and turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Let it sink in. Every time we turn to the Lord, we repent. The word repent is not a bad thing. The word repent is turning away for something that I have been not doing before. I have not been spending a lot of time in prayer. I have not been reading his word. I have not been meditating upon it. Whatever you have not done for a while, you are turning towards it. That is repent. It's not a bad word. It's a very good word. Every time you turn to the Lord, the veil is taken away. What kind of whale? Look at that. Now the Lord is the Spirit. You know why I love the scriptures? You have to catch it. Who is the Lord here? The Holy Spirit is the Lord. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we all with unveiled face continually seeing as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are progressively being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to another glory which comes from the Lord who is the Holy Spirit. Who is operating on this earth? The Holy Spirit. The Father is in heaven. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit is operating on the earth. And where is he right now? He's right inside of you and I. And every time we turn away from things that we should not get into and turn into towards the Lord, the veil is lifted off. And glory, we step into a glory, into a glory, into him. And we are transformed. Liberty comes into our life. Freedom comes into our life. And we become one with the Lord. And those who are one with the Lord, they are one with Him. And I just want you and I to get this, my brothers. Transformation is a very nice word. But a transformed life is what will bring glory to God. So, our journey, every moment of my life, is not that I need to live my life, read my Bible, go to Sunday church, do this. It's like every day, every moment of my life, have a living sacrifice for the Lord, unto the Lord. You know, Paul got beaten, got bruised, got thrown from the top, and then he gets raised from the dead, and then he goes preaching again. A man, a highly educated man. How much more you and I must give our life to the Lord. Let's all stand. I would love to preach more, but I'm out of time. We're going to spend a little bit of time in small groups today, if you don't mind. And here's what I want you to take some time. How is your transformation journey with the Holy Spirit? How are you willing to repent, which is turn from some of the things of your life, so that the veil could be lifted up of your life? There are some things that I'm learning every day in my own life. Be consistent in your service to the Lord. The one word is faithful. Whatever you do unto the Lord, be consistent with it. 
you know, Marina and I have been doing this church now for 15 years. Oh, my Lord. Someday we would like to say, we need a six-month vacation. But no, bless my wife. She's like, we're going to church. Sunday's for the Lord, you know. And we said, yes, we're going to do that. You know, we, we, we teach our boys. Sunday's for the Lord. Doesn't matter which church you go to, but go to church. Belong to the Lord. Consistent, faithful. Be faithful unto Him. Number two, Lord will test you with this talents. Matthew 25. For some He gives five, some He gives three, some He gives one. He will test you. He will give you something to do. And He will test you how you do it. A lot of people don't like test. I remember early days in school, I never liked test. I used to cheat, look at other people, and I used to write my test. You know? We can't cheat in this. You're on your own. The Lord will test you. He will give you something to do, and then He will see for a season, how is this person doing? And the last one, be continued to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, 18 to 21. Be continued to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you know how blessed we are as a generation that has the Holy Spirit around us? Read the book of Thessalonians. There is coming a season and the Holy Spirit will be lifted up. There will be no Holy Spirit on earth. What would be that day? Do you want to be here? Think of that. There is a time coming when the Holy Spirit will be lifted up and all those who are full of the Holy Spirit will be gone from here. That's why the Bible says, continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit now. How do I do it? Prayer and worship through scriptures. Make sure, keep for time for prayer. Oh, I don't have time for prayer. I'm too busy with life. Cut out some of the things that's not important. Put prayer in your life. Worship the Lord. What is worship the Lord? Not playing Spotify and having a cup of coffee is not worship. Worship is singing unto Him, praising Him and thanking Him. Be thankful to the Father for everything. And be accountable to people at home and leaders at church. I'm just going to pray a blessing over you this evening. But I'd like you to spend time in your small group today for the next 10, 15 minutes. Fellowship, chat. But how is your transformational journey? Father, I ask you to bless our evening today. And thank you for everyone. Thank you for Pastor Jimmy to come and lead worship for us today. Thank you for all that we have today. It is unto you, Father, we've given. God, could you fill us with the Holy Spirit more and more. Fill us through our worship, through our study of the Bible, through our reading of the Word, through our time at home praying with each other. Father, fill us with the Holy Spirit as we engage with you in everything we do. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Parents, you may have little children, if you can pick them up now, but small groups, if you can sort of move around and sit with somebody and just mingle, that would be amazing. Thank you.